video that you're about to watch is a live stream that I recorded live. Now, if the content that you find doesn't really match what you're looking for, it's very possible that this is a video that's part of a series. So if it doesn't make sense where you're finding this particular video, then just click on the description down below and you will find a link that will take you to the full series and you can start with video number one and go through all of the videos in sequence. If you like the content and it helps you out, then great. If you'd like more information, then you can always check me out at FileMakerMagazine.com. All right, uh, let's continue on with this series. Um, if you've watched the earlier videos, great. Um, if not, and this is gonna give you what you want, we are talking about uh, complex parsing. Now, in a video previous to this one, again, it really works out to your advantage if you go in sequence. There should be a link in the description if you wanna go to the uh, channel, unless you're watching this live as I record it. Uh, then I haven't set those up yet, but they will be there. Um, we are going to do some complex parsing. I've been showing this solution and it's extremely simple right now. It is just one button to scan and it is, uh, you would open that on a copy of FileMaker Go, which is free uh, through the iOS store or Apple store. We scan a driver's license, we get this gobbledygook in and then we want to parse it. I talked in a previous video about how to find the specifications. We are now going to follow the specifications. We've set up a little bit of our development environment, but there's one quick little thing that I'm going to introduce you to, and that is taking advantage of your keyboard, just because I have to do this on my setup. In the previous video, I showed how to install some plugins under the uh, preferences. And we took a look at those, we installed those plugins and were able to use those, in particular the MBS plugin and being able to use it syntax highlighting. Very important when we're going to be writing complex code and we already looked at uh, the previous video of the let function, which is the first thing that I think most developers sh should learn how to do. So I am interested in showing you how to assign keyboard shortcuts to get into things because as I develop this environment, I'm going to show you the keyboard shortcuts that I use. I am oftentimes in and out of the manage custom functions, but as you can see right here, under the manage, I only have keyboard shortcuts for the database, layouts, and scripts. So, before, right before we get to that complex, let's see how we can assign some keyboard shortcuts. There are applications on Windows, but on Windows you can pretty much find, it's a key sequence of more than a few keys, unfortunately, but it is possible to do the same thing that we're doing here on the Macintosh. On the Macintosh, we have in System Preferences a nice feature under the keyboard area. We click on the keyboard and then we're going to find this one right here that we're looking at, Shortcuts. We click on Shortcuts and then down here at the bottom we're going to find Application Shortcuts. We click on that and you can see that I have already added FileMaker 18. If you would like to add FileMaker 18, you simply click the plus sign that we have right here. And when you say applications, when you select FileMaker 18, 19, 16, 17 is not going to come up by default. What we have to do is scroll all the way to the bottom where we have this other option. When we select other, we are then able to navigate specifically to FileMaker 18 and then we can select and add the application. Once you have added the application, it's now just a matter of clicking the plus sign for each item that you want to add. You can see that I've already added the data viewer with control D and the debugger with control B. Now your first question might be, why the heck are you using the control key? But that's because that's really far away for my pinky to hit. Well, I have done this for decades now, or for as long as I know that is possible to do. In this same keyboard area, under the initial keyboard tab, down at the bottom, we have this option of modifier keys. So I click this and I bring it up, and I don't want my carabiner, I want my actual keyboard, which happens to be a Mac Alley Slim key, and I want you to notice what I have done. I have remapped the caps lock key to the control key and the control key to the caps lock key. Now you might be thinking, why did I do that? because the home row is very easy to use. Think about it, look at your hands right now. Go ahead, click pause the video, or I'll just stop talking for a second. Did you take a look? Did you look down there? If you know how to touch type and your hands are on home row, you have a key sitting right next to the A key that is completely useless and unused. How many times do you use the caps lock? I don't, ever. 
so why not assign it? This is what makes my FileMaker development really fast because I can now assign keyboard shortcuts to control key sequences and my fingers don't have to move a whole lot. In fact, off of the A key, it's just control B, control D, control this, control whatever. So I am going to assign a keyboard shortcut because we are now going to go over to FileMaker and all I have to do is look at the menu that I want. In this case, it is custom functions with a dot, dot, dot. So I go over to my keyboards and I go to my shortcuts, I go to my apps, I select on FileMaker 18, I click plus and I just type in custom functions dot dot dot. I think that will work. And I happen to use the keyboard sequence of control equals for some reason for my keyboard shortcut for my custom functions. So I should be able to now hit control equals and look at that, brings up my custom functions right there. You can see that it is now available to me with a control sequence and I sign keyboard shortcuts for all of these. Um, actually for security, I do command shift A which in my mind represents accounts. For value lists, I do command shift V, V for value lists. Um, and some of these others, I don't do external data sources themes, control shift T for accessing my themes because I'm in and out of them. Any area that you tend to be in and out of frequently, it's good to have. So let's open up our custom function. And for some of you from the very first video since I started this series, which I'm recording them all in one day, but in 15 minute segments, which I needed to drag this out and set, which I'll set for 12 minutes now, 10 minutes. Um, you are looking for the function. Let me show you where that function is. Now, before I do this, you are able to follow along with me and do some of this code yourself, which I highly suggest if you're trying to learn FileMaker, or you can just copy and paste the code, just watch as I go through the code and explain what happened or how I wrote the code. Um, so let's go to, actually to my desktop here, and we'll go to Safari, there is the URL. So let me give you that on screen. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit wider right here. Actually, the most important thing that you need to see when it comes to this URL, and I'll put this link in the description, uh, eventually I'm recording this live, github.com slash FileMaker Standards FMP Standards. So this is something I created uh, back in 2010. Um, I just started documenting back then how I had been developing. Um, it hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention in the last uh, five years or more. Uh, there is a website. It's at filemakerstandards.org. Org, I think, yeah, .org, the .com, if you put in .com, it'll redirect to the .org. But it's just a place where I started documenting how I was creating FileMaker solutions. The standards I use, the code, you've already seen the let function video just a few videos ago that shows you how you should write clean, uh, good code. And we're going to see that in our complex example here. But this is the function right here. You are going to find it under this right here, AAMVA card. You're able to go to this, you will see the full function. There are two ways to get this. You can simply select and highlight all of this and copy and put this into your FileMaker file as you follow along. Or you can click on this link right here that says RAW. When you click on RAW, you will see that it will just open a web browser window with just the RAW text. From here, I can do a Command or a Control A, select it all, copy it, and go over to my FileMaker database which we will hide that window now. Go over to my FileMaker database, open my Manage Custom Functions, click New, and paste that code in. Now it is possible in the world of FileMaker to copy and paste an actual custom function once you have it in one file. You can now copy it to any other file by simply just selecting that custom function and copy and paste. Notice that on the dialog there is no copy and paste button like there is in the manage database when you're defining your fields, but you can use control C and control V in order to paste custom functions across files. Very useful uh, in terms of being able to reuse your code. So we are going to walk through this complex code. We are finally at the point where we need to parse all of this information according to the specifications. Now in one of the earlier videos that I shot, I mentioned, and let me see if preview is going to simply have it, I do still have it open. Here is the document that I found, the standard that defines 
all driver's licenses across the United States that decide to follow that standard. And I suggested that if you're in a country other than the U.S., please go find that standard and code it according to the same way that I did here. We do not have to think about how we want to parse this information. We have to follow the specifications, and it's all done for us. So as I scroll up here, I will get to a point where I'm familiar with. It took me about two hours to do this, but here we go. There's the starting point right there. So in the specification, once I got it, I could see and verify that it's PDF 417. FileMaker supports that. Great. I read the documentation, and the documentation leads me down this path where we have a header right there. And when I start to read the information, I can see that it says it starts with, it's a 2D symbol encoded barcode, the PDF 417, and it starts with the at symbol. Lo and behold, the data that I scanned starts with the at symbol. As we read through the documentation, we find out something very interesting, and I want you to be aware of this. Now, we have this area right here that says field and bytes. Now, when we're think talking about bytes, uh, we don't have to deal with that a whole lot in the world of FileMaker, but in essence, um, depending on the language that you're using, it's either a, um, I forget, two bytes versus four bytes or eight byte languages, I forget. Somebody will put it down in the comments, but it's just an item I would need to reference. Um, we each character in our ASCII code here for the US is just going to be one byte. So the at symbol is one byte. You can see that it is a fixed value of one byte. So we, we're dealing with the header. Remember, we're dealing with the header. The header has one field, field two, field three, and field four. And we read this and we see that it starts with the at symbol and that has a decimal line feed character. Then it has a decimal 30 and then it has a decimal 13. Now, the reason that you're getting this information, you may be thinking, this is boring. Why are you doing this, Matt? This is the number one thing that a lot of developers ultimately end up getting confused by because they don't know about it. They don't know about what are called um, encodings and line endings, which is a very important thing in FileMaker and all programming, uh, in fact. The line endings in FileMaker each time that we get a return where we go from one line to the previous line in FileMaker, if we were to type that, and let's see if I can get this to, to select here. I want that and I just want one. There we go. So I highlight it and I'll show you how to do this and also how to inspect. If we were in FileMaker field and we're just typing and we hit the carriage return, that is a carriage return or a number 13 in decimal of that carriage return is represented by that. But this data, when it was captured, notice that it was captured with a character that it says right here, this LF or this character 10. You always, always have to know that if the data is not input into FileMaker and comes from outside, the possibility that the, the data has a line feed character or a line feed character and a return character does exist. So in standards like email, um, you will have, a, I believe, a line feed and a line character, but we're, we need to know how to see these characters in order to successfully parse this and verify that what we capture also matches what the standards say. So we go into our uh, magic data viewer, which I just brought up with control, and we are going to look at all of our data. So I'm going to add our data right there and we can see that it pops right in. So we're going to grab the first character. Now I could use the left and say I want to from the left grab one character and I get my at symbol what it starts with. But I know that I'm going to want characters one and two because if I go get the left two, get the left three, get the left four, five, you can see now it's just grabbing all of those characters. But remember, out of all of our data, when we're looking at our data, we look at this and it looks like we have line one, line two, and then line three. But instead, there are actually four characters before we get to line three. And we can confirm that by looking at what we just did. Left, and we look at our characters and we get four of them and we go to five. By the time we get to the four, the fifth character, we're on the third line. So let's look at each of these values. Instead of using the left, we're going to use the middle, and I'm going to get my data. Well, that actually, I want to pull that out 
So I'm going to cut that and I'm going to put in the middle and then I'm going to put in my data and I'm going to start at character one and get a number of characters one. All right, now let's use our, our coding that we know how we can do things a little bit easier. I'm going to put in a let and I'm going to say uh, data equal this and then I'm going to hit a return and the return value that I'm going to return, it could just be data. Let's just return that for right now. So there I'm returning my at symbol. There are two functions in FileMaker that we can use in order to see what a single value is. They are code right there where you supply the text and then the inverse of that is going to be char where you supply the number. Now right now we're only dealing with number 10 and number 13 and let's see if we can determine where those are. We're going to wrap this code function around data or take data and put it there. What did our documentation said? Our documentation said that the very first field is going to have a fixed byte of one and it's going to be decimal 64. FileMaker is telling us exactly that. It tells us it's the at symbol, it tells us it's 64. The next thing it says it's going to be is a line feed character and it's going to be 10, so let's test that. We go back over to FileMaker and we say we want to grab out of the middle, we want to start at character number two. Decimal number 10. Well, let's refer to our documentation. Decimal number 30 is going to come next, and decimal 13 is going to come after that. So, in our data, what we see are three lines. We can't assume that there's nothing on any of those lines because there are invisible characters. We go to character number three, and there it is, decimal 30. And we go to character number four, and there is decimal, there is 13, or our actual hard return. So the reason that I showed you this, and the reason that I'm calling it complex data, is because it's important to know that you're always, you always have to be willing to look for invisibles if you're going to be a competent developer. If you're not willing to look for invisibles and you can't figure out why it's not working, that's usually why. It's either a data mismatch, a permissions issue, or it's an invisible that you can't see, but you're making an assumption that the data is there. Very, very important lesson, and very important to get it at the very beginning of your coding career. So, we now know that we can use this standard in order to break things down, and it spells it out for us so clearly right here. Look at uh, field number five, the file type. This is the designator of that identifies the file type as an AAMV compliant format. ANSI with a blank space after the fourth character. It's telling you that it has five bytes. So in the custom function, what you're going to see when you look at the custom function as I open it up is everything that exactly follows this format. In fact, everything that we've learned in the previous video about using a let function is done right here. Everything that I taught you in those previous 20 minutes. I am making this data easy to understand. In this custom function, I have the name of the function, AAMVA card. Some data is going to come into that. I just named the parameter the name of data. You can use as many parameters to whatever function you want. This function, I know that all it's going to do is simply generate or, or create this uh, JSON for me. Then I just break everything down. That's, that's all that this is. It's not super complex. I know that even if you're a brand new beginner, you're going to be able to go into this custom function and look at this and read most of it. Now this first part, it may be a little bit confusing, but I've left you a note. This happens to be the combination of all of those first four characters, 64, 10, 30, and then 13. Now this is what's known as a little bit, um, you can call, I believe this is legitimately could be called a checksum. A checksum is basically a sequence of values that says the data that you're going to be getting it needs to be equal to this. If it isn't, then it doesn't check out and that's not good. Meaning you're either going to discard it or you're going to do something with it. Maybe send back a response of 
I didn't receive the, the valid data. This is actually how the whole of the internet works. It's based on sending packets, and in those packets, they have checksums. This is what I was expecting. Did you get what I was sending? Oh, yes, I got what you expected that you sent that you were expecting to send me. We're doing the same thing here with our data. This is basically, it's why I called it check, in fact. I am checking for the first four characters to make sure that they match what they would be. This is how you can sort of validate that the data you're receiving is the data that you're receiving. Now, there's more that could be done in this function that I'm not doing which comes in the form of the fact that they give you the length of the data and uh, where it starts. So you would be able to actually write a checksum that would look at all the data, and if somebody changed the last name and they either added or removed a character, then the checksum wouldn't work out. And it would say, somebody's trying to fake this license, it's not a valid license. So of course, with the standards, anybody would be able to fake it if they wanted to because they have all of the specifications. So here we have a variable that says, is this valid? So we're taking what we know is a known value, and then we are comparing that against our data. So we take the first four values of the data, we convert it using the code function, which we just saw, which if this calculation renders out correctly, it will render this right here. And if this is equal to this, then we know that it's probably in the right format and we're going to be able to now proceed and parse this. That's the first thing that I have in my function, but it's not the first thing that I did. In fact, it's the last thing that I wrote in this custom function. I simply went in and started to parse out the data and here's where you can see all of the different things. The very first character, that's our compliance value. In fact, let's go look at the specification and look at what they call things. Compliance indicator, data element separator, record separator, segment terminator, file type, issuer identification number. Now let's go back over to the FileMaker code. Element separator, record separator, segment terminator, file type, issuer number. Do you see that in this what I'm trying to show you is when you're a good programmer, you're not always creating this code out of nothing. You're oftentimes following what somebody else has already done and you're just putting it into the format where you need to use it. Now this didn't exist in FileMaker before and that's why I put it in here, but I also use the same terminology that exists because it's much more confusing if I abstract and try to come up with my own technology or my own naming to make it completely separate. There is a one-for-one -one match in most all of the code here in terms of what you see in the specification and what you see in this custom function. And that makes it usable for everybody. And that's what I suggest that you do whenever you're dealing with an external specification like this. So. I took the opportunity within the uh, specification to even add things where it breaks all of these different parts down. Ultimately, I'm going to let you go through this code. I have given you the code and I'm not going to go through all of it other than the, uh, the while parts in here because those are the parts that can be confusing and to explain this part right here. So we have the specification that is telling us how all of this works and what the bytes are. So each of these sequences, if we look at this, we'll go ahead and click cancel, or click OK right there. So this is a sequence right here. It says the first five bytes. And it says then this part is the version number. And then these two represent something else. And then this represents something. And then starting with this DL, going up to this right here, these specify this is the driver's license part, which is everything that ranges from here down to here. And then the next one starts right here with these sections with the Z. But if you look within the data, you can see right there if that designates where this starts and how long it is, and then this designates where the next one down there starts and how much exists, Everything is spelled out for you. You just have to figure out in FileMaker, okay, they've told me exactly where it starts and where it ends for all of the different sections. And there could be multiple sections. 
you can see that this is much better to process according to the specifications rather than trying to do something ad hoc on my own. Because if a section, if a license has three sections or four sections, it doesn't matter. I'm doing everything to the specifications. Very cool. I love this stuff. So the last thing that I'm going to wrap up with, because I know I've hit my 15 minute limit on this video, is go through the custom function. Look at how simple it is in terms of it is simply just identifying each of the pieces and simply pulling them out using what we've already learned, the middle function, saying go to this character, pull out this many characters, that's what that value is. And you're assigning them into these little cubby holes. And it's only until we get to the subfile section. That's where we end up using the while function in order to cycle through all of this data. Now the while function, I'm going to leave it for another video at another time. In fact, we'll probably pick that up maybe in a few videos from now. Um, in fact, we'll probably do that in the next video. This will be my last one for today as I'm recording. Um, and we will go through the while function and break things apart and take a look at a pre versus a post loop. That is where the counter exists within the uh, assignment part in terms of when the exit statement gets evaluated. But we will break the while down because the while and the loop script step within scripting are two of the things, that's four, two of the things that you should learn first. And here's why. If you know how to identify a pattern and you know how to walk across that data, you will always be way ahead of the game than going and doing things manually. And what by this I mean, I see script after script after script from FileMaker developers, even intermediate developers, where they will have 20 different set field steps. Set this field, set this field, set this field, set this field, set this field. You can write that whole structure within a loop and say, in English, here's the same thing, Here's a list of fields that I want you to set, and here's the values that I want to set. And then the loop says, okay, go to this first one and set this. Go to the second one, set this. And that is that is programming. That is way better than uh, becoming a FileMaker learner or beginner and using 20 set fields when I can teach you how to use one looping script that will set all of your fields or do whatever you want, or use a while function and be able to say, hey, look at this. I have a range of data. In fact, here, looking at this, I can see that this range of data has a fixed number. I could count these if I wanted to, and a loop can count these if I want to. Hey, I can see that on this data, the first three characters are just a designation, but then the rest of it is data. And those are the only two qualities of this data. The fact that there's multiple, and then the fact that there is a uh, an item in front, and it's always three characters. If you recognize that, then you loop it. And that's how you can program things and be much more efficient when you're writing your FileMaker solution. And that's what we're going to do in our next video. We will take a look at the while function and then we will get our data from this field into fields themselves and then we will protect our data because we want to be able to secure this up. If we're going to deal with medical uh, data, there's HIPAA regulations and all kinds of stuff and we need to be able to uh, encrypt that and have, be able to have a, an encryption key and be able to have only certain people look at it and uh, some people not. So uh, much luck to you. Uh, again, if you're interested in these videos and you like to be notified, I will be scheduling some based on a schedule. You will know when they're going to go live and I will also be doing a question and answer. I will definitely schedule a, a question and answer for that, um, set up an event time, and we'll just see how many people pop into the chat and uh, ask questions about what we're developing as we're developing that, and uh, hopefully that'll help uh, future viewers with this series as well. So much luck to you, and uh, see you next time.